Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to talk about chapter 20 in our book, and the focus is going to be biotechnology. And before you watch this video cast, or after you watch this video cast, at some point you really re really need to read chapter 20 and make sure you understand these four points. Okay, you need to understand how DNA is cloned using plasmids as vectors. You need to understand that DNA technology is the study of three different things, sequencing DNA, um, how DNA is expressed to produce proteins, and the functions of genes, whether they, they code for proteins or code for regulatory proteins. And number three, you've got to understand how cloning of organisms is leading to our better understanding of stem cells. And finally, the practical applications of DNA technology, all right, and how they affect our lives, for good or for bad. All right, the Human Genome Project is kind of where DNA technology first entered the mainstream consciousness. Uh, this was a multi-billion dollar project that was um, contributed to by many different nations, including the United States, Japan, France, Italy, and so on, England and whatnot. But the, it was completed in 2001, and what came out of the Human Genome Project was a complete sequence of a human's DNA all the A's, T's, C's, and G's. It came out to be about three billion base pairs long. And by 2010, scientists had applied the same technique to lots of other species, so we had the genome sequences for um, rats and mice and mosquitoes and plants like um, rice, uh, crop plants like rice, uh, yeast, and the list goes on and on and on. But lots and lots of other species have been sequenced since 2010. And the question remains, though, what can we do with this code? Why did we spend so much money on this? And the simple answer is because people can make so much money using DNA technology. This has really changed uh, molecular biology and opened up lots and lots of fields in medicine and research that nobody had even thought about in the 1960s or 1970s. So this is a big deal. Now, basically what's happening here is once you sequence DNA, you have genetic code. And once you know the genetic code, okay, you can manipulate the code. You can recombine DNA from one organism and put it into another organism, for example. Now, this is much easier to do with bacteria than with eukaryote cells, but it's certainly possible. And what comes out of all this is biotechnology. Okay, We end up with practical purposes, um, results, uh, things people can buy and sell that result from this manipulation. All right, so the first logical step in recombinant DNA technology is you have to take the gene that you have, the gene that you're interested in, and convert it into millions and millions of copies. And this process is called DNA cloning. And bacteria are used to clone DNA. Um, here's the picture from your textbook. But basically, what happens is you locate the gene that you're interested in, okay, which could be data coming from something like the Human Genome Project. Okay, we'll call this gene your gene of interest. Okay, then you have to insert this gene into a vector, or in other words, you have to put this gene into something that can get that gene into a living cell. And in this case, we're going to use a bacterial plasmid. Okay, then you have to grow bacteria that have taken up this plasmid. Okay, and as the bacteria grow and reproduce, they copy the DNA along with the plasmid that it's riding in millions and millions of times. And from this, you can go two different directions. You can either extract the copies of the gene that you've made from the bacteria, or you can extract a gene product, a protein that's been translated from this gene. Uh, for example, human growth hormone or um, clot buster drugs that you may have heard about um, with people who have, who have had strokes. Now, in order to get your gene of interest into a plasmid, the plasmid has to be cut open. It has to be opened up. And this task is taken care of by a special group of enzymes called restriction enzymes. And restriction enzymes have the ability to cut uh, DNA after certain restrictions, restriction site codes, a specific code called the restriction site. For example, there's a restric restriction enzyme called e ECO-R1 or ECO-RE. Sometimes people say it that way. It's um, derived from E. coli, and it's a restriction enzyme that can cut at the code GAATTC. And of course, if you um, find the complementary sequence of that, it reads the same, the same way backwards. So sometimes people call this a palindromic sequence. And what happens is when the ECO-RE cuts this sequence, it produces sticky ends. 
which are little dangly ends of DNA that can reattach or anneal to other pieces of DNA. And so these sticky ends are why we use restriction enzymes. And they're called restriction enzymes because they can only cut at specific restriction sites that are known. So in this diagram, you can see how the bacterial plasmid before treatment was cut open to produce these sticky ends. Okay, so this is before. Here you can see where the cut was made. We made a little cut right here. We made a little cut right here and then a cut right here. And this zigzag cut produces the sticky ends we see here. And then you can take your gene of interest that you want to insert, which has matching sticky ends, and under the right circumstances, it can insert itself right into the piece of code here, and so you end up with what's called a recombinant DNA molecule. Pretty cool stuff. Now, how do you actually do this? Well, we have a couple problems we have to overcome. The first problem is you have to have a way of identifying bacteria that have actually taken in or taken up the plasmid. The second problem is you have to actually figure out which of the um, plasmids actually contains the gene that you've tried to insert. So if you can overcome these two problems, then you um, can make this, this technique work. And to solve these problems, we're going to use a couple known genes. Something called um, the LAC-Z gene, which gives bacteria the ability to digest lactose and an ampicillin resistance gene, which gives bacteria the ability to survive in the presence of an antibiotic called ampicillin. Now, your materials list for this lab include E. coli, which is the living bacteria, and this living bacteria does not have the ability to digest um, a form of lactose called X-gal or X-galactose. Okay, um, you have plasmids that have been engineered to contain the ampicillin resistance gene, here colored in red, and the LAC-Z gene here colored in blue. Now, you also need a restriction enzyme. And this restriction enzyme has the ability to cut at a restriction site that is in the middle of the LAC-Z gene. And you need your gene of interest. Here I've represented it in white. Okay, and it has sticky ends that match the sticky ends produced by the restriction enzyme. And finally, you need some agar plates, which you're going to grow your bacteria on. And these agar plates have nutrient media mixed with the antibiotic ampicillin, and a sugar called X-gal has been added to it. Now, the cool thing about X-galactose is if the bacteria digest it, the breakdown products are bright blue. Okay, so your first step is you get your gene and your plasmids ready. Okay, this gene of interest that you're, you maybe you want to insert could be something like the insulin gene from a human. Then you get your plasmids, which, like I said earlier, have been engineered to contain two genes, two known genes, the LAC-Z gene and the um, ampicillin gene. All right, step two, you're going to add the restriction enzyme to both your gene of interest and your plasmid. This is going to produce the matching sticky ends we talked about earlier. Okay, you're going to mix then the restricted plasmid and the restricted gene together so that you end up with some plasmids that are going to take in the gene. And that's what I'm showing right here. So in this diagram, the restriction enzyme has cut the plasmid right here, produced two sticky ends, and the gene of interest can insert itself in. So what you end up with is a recombinant plasmid. So this is your recombinant plasmid. And notice, if this happens, the LAC-Z gene has been broken, literally split in two by the restriction site. Now, some of the plasmids are going to take up the gene, like we see right here. All right, This one has taken up the gene. Some will take in other fragments of DNA, but not the gene. And some are going to actually just reattach. So this end will reattach to this end with nothing in the gap. So that leaves the LAC-Z LAC gene intact. So you have three possible outcomes there. So step four, you're going to mix the plasmids with your living E. coli bacteria. And what's going to happen is, under the right circumstances, some of the bacteria are going to take up the recombinant plasmid. If that happens, those bacteria have transformed, and they are now resistant to ampicillin, but they cannot digest the X-galactose because their, um, their LAC-Z gene is broken. Now, other bacteria are going to take up other plasmids. All right. Now, if they take up other plasmids, they have also been transformed, and they're going to be resistant to ampicillin because they have the AMPAR gene. But because these plasmids have not taken have not um, had the gene of interest inserted, the um, X-gal digesting gene, the LAC-Z gene, is going to be intact. So these bacteria are going to be able to eat the X-gal and produce the blue product. 
and some of the bacteria are not going to take up any plasmids. And those poor bacteria are not transformed, and they are going to die in the presence of ampicillin and not grow at all. And step five is you're going to take your bacteria and you're going to plate them. You're going to um, run some of these, run the bacterial sample over the agar plates so that the um, individual bacteria each find a little place to settle down and start growing and doing binary fission. Okay, and the bacteria that took up the recombinant plasmid are going to grow and turn blue. The bacteria that took up other plasmids are going to grow, but they're going to stay white. And the bacteria that didn't take up any plasmids at all are not going to grow and they're going to die. So what you end up with is a plate that looks like this. Every little blue dot is a pile of millions and millions of bacteria that are descended from the, the original bacterium that took up the plasmid, but their plasmids don't have the gene of interest. So their LAC-Z gene is working and they produce um, the blue product. The white dots represent gene uh, bacterial colonies that are descended from an original bacterium that took up the plasmid so it can grow. It has the penicillin resistance, excuse me, the ampicillin resistance, but it can't digest the X-gal, so it stays white. And all the bacteria that didn't take up any plasmids don't grow at all, so you don't get any colonies from them. So the ones you're interested in are the white ones because those are the bacteria that contain plasmids that took up or contain the gene of interest that you were trying to insert. For example, you could have inserted the gene for human insulin into the bacterium. And this actually has been done. A company called Eli Lilly has patented a recombinant bacterium that can produce human insulin for diabetics. And they make billions of dollars a year selling this. And these bacteria, in the process of growing and reproducing, produce the insulin, which can be refined and purified from um, the bacterial soup that, that's growing. And this is where we get human insulin from, and this is what uh, most diabetics are using today. Thanks for listening, and we'll stop there.